Hello, this is Eva Feldman with Section 2 of the lesson on organ transplantation. Today we'll talk about assessment and management, including the transplant coordinator role and considerations before, during, and after surgery. In the last section we talked about the organ donation coordinator, but here we'll talk about the transplant coordinator, a different role. The transplant coordinator role, it could be a nurse practitioner. I've seen some roles filled by RNs where I work, but they're actually involved in all phases of client care. They do a lot of client education, they arrange appointments, they oversee preparation, surgery, and post-op care. They, uh, the nurse practitioner especially would evaluate the immunosuppressive regimen and so on. A lot of things they do. Now let's imagine we're with the patient immediately pre-op. Their organ is available and we're the pre-op nurse. So you have to think about what pre-op labs and tests do you think would be needed when once the organ is available. Think about what do all pre-op clients need. They're likely going to need a chest x-ray, an EKG, all kinds of blood work. The labs listed here CBC, coags, electrolytes, glucose, BUN, creatinine, all of that, LFTs, a type and cross, a UA. Patients getting a kidney transplant are going to need dialysis within 24 hours is something for you to keep in mind. Now let's look at some organ-specific surgical considerations. When you're talking about a kidney transplant, what they do is place it heterotopically, which means it's not in the same place a native kidney would be. It's in a different place. And where they put it is in the iliac fossa. To give you an idea of where that is, if someone came in with right iliac fossa pain, it could be appendicitis, so it's in that area. But the kidney could be placed either on the right or the left side, either way. This is important. These patients should avoid NSAIDs, IV contrast, and live vaccines. When you're talking about an organ transplant, you have to think about the particular organ and what is going to be sewn together to make it work inside the donor's body. Sewn together, of course, equals anastomosed. An artery is going to be sewn to an artery, vein to vein, and so on. And with the kidney, a ureter is sewn to the bladder. A special technique is used to prevent backflow from the bladder back up into the ureter. There's no innervation from the donor ureter into the recipient's bladder. There's no nerve attachment there. After this type of surgery, you could see clots in the urine. You're likely to see them because there are sutures in the bladder. These patients might need a stent in the ureter, but they always have an indwelling catheter. You need to expect hematuria for a few days in these patients. Liver transplants are performed orthotopically, which means they take out the native liver and they put the donor liver in its place. There are major anastomoses, vascular anastomoses for the liver listed there, and also with the bile duct, they anastomose that together. And they use a T-tube to keep that passageway open. During surgery, maintaining blood volume is crucial. They use a rapid infusion of blood products. They use a cell saver so they can give the patient's own blood, blood back. And they might even use a pump to get that blood back into the patient's circulation back to the heart. For heart transplants, these are also performed orthotopically. And now you know what that means. They take out the native heart and they replace it with the donor heart. This is important. An orthotopic heart transplant is the most common type. There's a surgical technique, it's called the lower and shumway technique, where they preserve part of the native atria and they use that to anchor in the donor heart. The donor heart has the SA node and the internodal pathways. The loss of native atrial anatomy can lead to mitral regurge, tricuspid regurge, atrial thrombus and tachydysrhythmias. Those are things to look out for. 
And as you can imagine, there are major anastomoses going on with the heart transplant. For pancreas organs, the entire pancreas is usually transplanted. In a client that has end-stage renal disease and diabetes, you might see them also receive a kidney either at the same time or at a different time. The pancreas graft survival rate is best when it's done with a kidney transplant, when they're done together. The pancreas, as you may suspect, is placed heterotopically in the right iliac area. The pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions, as you may remember. The exocrine substances in a normal pancreas, they go into an internal pancreatic duct system, but you can't do that when the pancreas is transplanted. So they have to do one of two approaches. One, they'll put a small section of a duodenum in with the pancreas for the exocrine secretions to drain into, and the other approach is to drain those secretions into the bladder. Some recipients get a single lung transplant and some get a double. When they do a single, the left is preferred because that main stem bronchus on the left side is longer. For a lung transplant, the donor bronchus is telescoped into the recipient lung or vice versa. The recipient bronchus is telescoped into the donor lung. Sometimes they do an end-to-end -end anastomosis using some type of flap caught in a mental flap, and that helps to improve the blood flow in that area. Other anastomoses, of course, the pulmonary artery, and then they have to anastomose the cuff of the atrium that has the pulmonary veins in it. Now let's talk about post-op care of the transplant patient. Post-op nursing care of these patients includes all the usual post-op care plus specifics for each organ. Now, what do all post-op clients need? You know this. What do you assess? What's, what's important? Airway, breathing, oxygen, if they're on a vent, their oxygenation and so on. What else? You know this too. Circulation, their vital signs, pain, level of consciousness. You look at all of this stuff, dressings, drains, tubes, IV sites, IV infusions, and more. For the transplant client, the medication regimen is going to be a primary concern. We'll talk about that in the next section. Plus, there's more specific care depending on the organ transplanted. For post-op kidney transplant clients, you need accurate urine output, not only from the donor kidney, but also from the native kidney because they're usually capped. You need to closely monitor their fluid and electrolyte balance, Meticulous eyes and nose, very important. You're going to look at their pre-op labs compared to the post-op labs, the renal function, CBC lights, all of that. For the immunosuppressive medications, you need to know what, when, how much we're given. You need the post-op regimen order so you can follow them closely. You need to prevent infection at all costs. This is important. What is the number one defense against the spread of infection? Right, hand washing, hand sanitizing. For these patients, you also need to monitor and detect early rejection. Uh, you need to assess and protect the hemodialysis access or the peritoneal catheter and anticipate possible problems with urinary drainage, leakage, and hyperkalemia. For the post-liver transplant patient, these are the goals of care. You know they're going to be, or likely to be, unstable hemodynamically, so you want to concentrate on getting them stable there, making sure their oxygenation is adequate, monitoring fluid and electrolyte balance. Since their liver may not be working yet, you want to make sure there's hemostasis and watch for coagulopathy. Of course, you're checking graft function, and since these patients are in the ICU, they're going to have invasive line monitoring. These are the reportable conditions listed here. Fever, if they're not tolerating their meds, if they're getting nausea and vomiting, if there's bloody drainage at the operative site, the incision site, if it's opening up, if they have pain and it's getting worse, if their BP is elevated, or if their glucose is elevated. Lots of things to look out for here with these patients. In an orthotopic heart transplant, the native atria that remain 
can still produce P waves. This is why you might see two P waves on your EKG strip. The atria beat independently, so there might be different rhythms also for each atria on your EKG strip. It's just kind of weird, but that's what it is. There are certain effects of denervation. Remember, we said that there's no nerve, no vagus nerve attached to the heart. Do you remember what the vagus nerve does to the heart? It slows it down. So these patients are going to have a higher heart rate from 90 to 110, and that would be normal for them. Plus, you won't see any respiratory variation in their EKG strip. For that same reason, atropine and isoproterenol will no longer work on this transplanted heart. Digoxin works, but not to reduce the heart rate, only to increase the strength of contraction. Circulating catecholamines will work on the donor heart, but it takes longer to work than usual sympathetic stimulation. Reflex tachycardia is absent. Beware orthostatic BP changes and make sure you change their position slowly. These patients, it's important to note, cannot have or feel chest pain. After a pancreas transplant, you know, you know this already, you're going to be monitoring their blood glucose. You might even need an insulin drip. Even minor ab abnormalities in their glucose levels or HbA1c could mean there's a problem with the graft, either rejection or thrombosis. You know you're going to monitor their pancreatic function. Remember the pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions. The exocrine drainage, when it's directed into a small piece of donor duodenum, it can be challenging to prevent infection. But when it goes into the bladder, it can lead to other complications. Post-op lung transplant patients, they might stay intubated for several days, depending. Their cough reflex is absent due to denervation. There is the possibility, it's fairly common, of a reperfusion injury that leads to pulmonary edema in these patients. Preventing infection in these patients is a primary nursing goal. Think about it. Your lungs are always exposed to the outside world. You're constantly breathing in and out your air. Unlike other organs, they're protected on the inside of your body. Prophylactic antibiotics may be ordered, so you're going to give those. Give meticulous mouth care. Make sure to restrict visitors. Nobody with an active infection should be near these patients. When you suction, it's got to be with strict aseptic technique. Of course, as we know, hand sanitizing, hand washing, all staff and visitors must comply with that. Other nursing focus includes increasing mobility as the patient's able, collaborating with respiratory therapy for chest PT, of course, monitoring the pulse ox, and making sure the daily chest x-rays are, are done as ordered. All right, it's time to relax and get ready for the second game of Kahoot. My granddaughter Ariana's ready. Directions for Kahoot are in the video description below. Thanks for listening. You're halfway done.